have to leave at 8.45. I have to split cells and put on overlay. Do another set of plaque assays. Hello, everybody. Good evening. It is January 6th. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Amy Rosenfeld. Hi, Amy. Hi, Vincent. How are you today? It's been a rough day. It has been quite the shit show. Oh, you cursed on network television. Oh, whatever. It's true. Well, whatever. I mean, somebody wrote in that I was uncaring, mean, and petulant. <laughs> yeah, not re Oh, it's hey, look, maybe I, Vincent not Rackin really. Vincent yellow for president in 2024. What do you think of that? I don't want to be president. Hi, Norway. Hello. Um... I don't know. I'm not big into oh, yeah. running. I'm not. I think that the people who take political office, I think you have to be stupid. Taiwan. Where else are we, folks? Oh, I still have to get There's that somebody map. from Canada. Yeah, Canada is a big country. Could be east, could be middle, could be west. Could be my favorite city. Oh, look at this. Finland. Yeah. I'd vote for Amy if I could. No, I'm smart enough Amy. not to. I'm too smart to go to run for political office. <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> hey, Wisconsin. South Carolina, sadly. Why sadly? I could have guessed, I guess. Amy, we love you, even with all your defects. <laughs> Seattle. Maybe they'd like to make a list and cross-reference it with Sweden. all of my defects. Australia, Miami, Southern California, New Zealand, Lebanon. I like Ch the Lebanon. Chicago, I Florida. I think that that's very interesting. Me Mendocino from Colorado, Western. That reminds me, you're having you're having Emily on Friday, right? That's right. It's all confirmed. Yes, yeah, confirmed. Western Massachusetts, probably close to. Um, who's it? What's Maybe by Allen. Allen. Melbourne, Minnesota, London, Spain, 2 a.m. That's pretty All late. All right, I'm done with this. I'm almost done. We need Amy. No BS attitude in government. Oh, if Amy were in government, man. <laughs> Asheville, North Carolina. <sighs> Seattle, Oregon. The UK, Kentucky. Okay, can we be done now? Okay, we can get into okay. questions. Well, I, I only have, I have 845. You want to do as many questions as possible. I have a okay. set of plaque assays sitting there. I have plaque assays for overlay, and I still need to make new plates and split my helos to do neutralization assays. I have so to say, I need uh, to get moving. Amy, I'm amazed that anyone's here. I would be thinking they're all, well, most of them are not from the U.S., so. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it sounded 50 50. I mean, I don't want to discuss it. It's just... Yeah. What's the difference between natural infection and receiving the vaccine? If I've already been infected and either had no symptoms or mild, why do I need to get the vaccine? It's right, an so, immune bo boost. Yeah, because you don't know what your level of immunity is after infection. You haven't been checked. It could be low, could be high. So you, you might as well get the vaccine to boost it, if anything, and you'll have a really good response and you'll have good memory. So that's what I tell everyone. I do have to say that I like this. I'm I'm looking at the screen and it's going past and I'm now Mrs. Grumpy. Uh, Being critical is grumpy. No, no, no. Being critical is not grumpy. When uh, I get grumpy, uh, you'll know. Yeah. Uh, Amy is mostly critical, which is fine. And sometimes she's grumpy with me and I know it, but it's okay. I don't mind, right, Amy? Right, but this is not grumpy. This is just critical. There's a difference. Uh, can the Binax um, now test accurately identify the new variants? Yeah, I don't see why not. Do you, what do you think, Amy? Uh, remind me again what the Binax now test is. There's a lot of tests, and I get Oh, them sorry. It's a rapid about. antigen test. Well, why uh, would it discuss the new variants? It's a point mutation. It's a point mutation that led to an amino acid change. If yes. it's a rapid antigen test, it's unless that all amino acid change really 
uh, alters the interaction, it's not going to pick them up. You only can pick them up by sequencing the Let's viral see. genome. Yeah, I mean, one amino so, acid change in the antigen is not going to affect. Well, sometimes the... it does. Like for 68 and Ian's peptide, it did. But in this case, it does not. So the answer is it can detect them. You won't have a problem with that. Pfizer measured their vaccine efficacy seven days after dose two. Is there precedent to say that that's how long it takes to get maximum efficacy after a booster dose? They did the seven days as the first initial time point. They're actually going out two years. Yeah, so they're going to keep going. It's But the, the first ones were where they got the 94%. You know, booster efficacy varies according to the antigen. The key is to wait until that first immune response has gone down and then go in with the booster. Because if you go in too soon, you know, the first response could interfere. So that's the Yeah, key but there. I'm not even sure that it it doesn't really decay after 21 days, the first immune response. So okay. that can't be correct. No, it does. It does decay. I don't think it does. I don't think it significantly decays. Whatever. You can look it up. But it doesn't sound right. If it takes 14 days or about 14 to 17 days to make the immune response, it can't be decayed four days later. No, it doesn't but sound for you're, all you're days 21, to, right. 21 to 28 days, you're not, you think it's not decaying? No. Well, that's what Brienne said on TWIV today. I, I think that that's kinetically incorrect, but okay. we can defer to her. I mean... She's no, the immunologist, I, I, but I think that there, I don't think that that is correct because when you look at what people did for natural immunity, for, yeah, natural immunity, like uh, Cromer and, and Theodore and everybody, they're not going seven to 14 days. They're not asking the people to come back seven to 14 days. They're come, right, they have right. a point line and then yeah. they came back three months later and some of those patients didn't decay at all. That's why they yeah, wrote papers that said, oh, look, durable, three months. So I, I don't think that that can be correct. Uh, I think uh, she missed Point taken, point taken. Kathleen says, my college daughter had SARS just before Thanksgiving. Should, should she be concerned with catching some mutation of the virus? Her words. <laughs> no, she shouldn't be no, worried about fine. it. She'll be fine. Um, and Oliver says, Amy with eight uh, exclamation points after it. Oh, here's yeah, a, a fundamental question. How many antibodies need to attach to a virus to make it unable to infect the cell? Very nice question. It depends on the virus. For influenza, actually, uh, only a few antibodies because apparently they make a conformational change in the particle. And some need more. It depends on the mechanism, so... What do you think, Amy? Do you have any uh, other numbers? Uh, so I think it depends on the vi I think it depends on the virus and what it's binding to. So there's very little spike on the surface of a coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. There's like what? Yeah. So doesn't you don't probably need a lot of antibodies because you don't have a lot of targets, right? You have yeah. like five to 10 molecules of spike on the surface. Yeah. So you have many fewer antibody binding regions. So maybe you only need two. Whereas like for our viruses, the picornas, there's 60 sites because it's non-enveloped. It's an icosahedral. It's going to have 60 equivalent surfaces. Right. So you're probably going to need a lot more because you have a lot more binding spots, exactly. right? Yeah, so it depends. So on the virus. it really depends. You probably don't need more than like two for HIV. You also have very little GP120 and 40 on the surface, right? Yeah, right. That's why it's been so very hard to make a vaccine because you can elicit an immune response, but what are you neutralizing? All right, Daniel says, can we go over the nanoparticle vaccine from Stanford? So this is a, it's kind of different from what's been made. It's spike, which is linked to an iron nanoparticle. So there are a bunch of spikes. Um, and you're giving them some iron? You're giving people iron, yeah. Okay. And they're saying it could be one dose. We'll see. It hasn't been in people 
has been in a phase three efficacy trial, the real metric is whether in a phase three efficacy it prevents disease, right? So you can do all your work yeah. on animals and so forth. But this is the similar idea to the Novavax, which is spike in, and the, the, the C termini of the spikes are aggregated, so it makes kind of a nanoparticle also. And that's just started phase three in people for efficacy. So I suspect they will reach their primary endpoint quickly because there's so many infections going on. Yeah, I would think so. You having Matt on TWIV? I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. If you're given vaccines your whole life and don't actually get infected, will your immune system be weaker, or are you saving your immune system from tough battles? Interesting. Interesting question. I think you have other infections that are dealing, are, are tweaking your immune system, right? You may, you may have asymptomatic infections. You have microbiome that is always interacting with your immune system. You have a virome. So I think, you know, even if you have... Uh, um, vaccines, it's not going to cover everything that you're getting. For example, all the rhinovirus infections, all the enterovirus infections you get, there are no vaccines for those, right, Amy, except for polio. Right. And rhinoviruses are the most ubiquitous infections that we have. More than 130 serotypes, they're the most ubiquitous things that we ever have. Kathleen wants to be your lab assistant. Sure. She can come and be my lab assistant. I have plenty of work. It's more than one person or two people can do. We're initiating work projects every day. Uh, my guitar looks the same as Eric Clapton. Well, it's a, it's it looks like a Fender Stratocaster, but it's not. It's a knockoff because I don't I can't afford a real one. But thank you. This is more important than politics. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, <clears throat> what do we think about the South African variant? It's a variant. So it's different from the UK variant. It arose in South Africa. It's similar and it has a lot of mutations that haven't been seen together in one SARS-CoV-2 before. And it's, it's been a variant. It's a variant. I'm just telling it's them another... what I know. I'm telling them what I know. I know, but I, I don't want a list of what you know. Okay. Some of the mutations are similar. Some of them are different. But she, she asked me what I think. So I'm telling her what I think. Okay. It's a variant. It's a variant. Get and it's to thought me. to be, it's allegedly, that's the word we use on Twitter now, allegedly more transmissible. Do you use it on Twitter or Twiv? Twiv. I not, not Twitter. Twiv. Yes. Yeah. Twitter, I, I didn't Twiv, realize Twiv. that we had all become law professors now. I'm You've committed an alleged crime. Some people allegedly stormed the Capitol today. Well, that's why we use the word because, you know, the press is saying the more transmissible virus, and we think it should be allegedly because they don't get this concept that if something hasn't been proven in science, you really shouldn't say it. Right, Amy? Yeah. Right. I know because I just read a Carl Zimmer article all about how we're fucking it up because we aren't sequencing and we aren't like panicked about the, we haven't panicked enough about the variants. I th I agree that we should be sequencing more, don't you think? Sure. I think- Sequence, uh, sequence away, it's pretty cheap by now. Yeah, I think- I mean, this idea more. that it's, this idea that it's really expensive is not correct. I mean, in Illumina, you, what? So when I did it, you could get, I'm sure it's way past this. You could get 10 gigs off of a single lane MyCell run and you could uh, barcode, I think, 384 different samples. Mm -hmm. a, that's a bucket load of data. Yeah, it and, is. and that was, you know, seven years ago at least. But wait, so I stopped it. Yeah, that was about six years ago that I stopped doing this. So I'm yeah. sure that it is way, and the cartridge was like a thousand dollars. So I think the cartridge for our MySeq run is like $500. You know, it's gone down tremendously. Like to say that sure. we can't afford it is not, no, is, totally is, there's just ridiculous. no, uh, there's no organization, you know? It's yeah, that's what, right. That's what this, um, 
epidemiologist or virologist at Stanford or something was quoted in Zimmer's article saying how there's no national infrastructure for this. Yeah, there should be. And there's, you know, and what I want to know is, okay, fine, we've all identified that there's no national, de, de, you know, infrastructure. There's no, nothing from the national federal government that tells you what to do. Okay. So we know what to do. Just do it. Well, now we're going to have a new admin. So hopefully we do but that. Whatever. Right? Yeah. But it's still going to take a long time for them to get, yeah, no. to get on to, to, on to par, you know, no matter how much you observe, no matter how many updates they give you, you still don't know the intricacies of what you're working with until you're actually there. And then it probably takes you another three months to get, up to speed and to talk to the right people and to find all the right people and to reassess whatever. But Amy, but, I think we need a, a genomics guru and I think you should be the genomics guru. No, I don't want to be the genomics guru. I, mean, I have why no interest. I, in, why did I know you were going to answer that way? I have no interest in doing that. It's okay. not, I'm not going to sit there and program a computer all day long. No, no you can, you can, Raul you can be the should director. do it. You can be the no, director. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be the director. All right, let's Raul answer another question. If you're infected with a virus and later with a variant that makes, that's weakly, more weakly neutralized, would you make new ant antibodies? Yes, you of would. Of course. You would make new against the variant and most likely you would also have a milder infection because there would be some cross reactivity. Why can a person who has recovered pass virus to others? Well, just because you have recovered symptoms doesn't mean that the virus is not replicating or yeah. reproducing. It has nothing to do with it. There are two different yeah. properties of the of infection. Uh, what about nitric oxide inactivating SARS-CoV-2? Nitric oxide isn't that laughing gas? <clears throat> it's nitrous. Oh, nitrous. <laughs> Nitric is, you know, made by uh, immune cells and, uh, yeah, it can inactivate viruses and uh, it can also kill virus infected cells. It can and also damage your tissues. It damages your tissues. So in, ma in mice, if you make mice, knock out mice that can't make nitric oxide, they have less pathology. And so it could be that if you have a polymorphism in a gene leading to nitric oxide, you could have more serious COVID. I haven't seen that pop up in any of the association studies, though. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, this is here we go. If the South African variant obviates monoclonals, do those functional differences make it a strain? No, I would say not. Those no, it makes are, it a different serotype. Could make could it a potentially a different serotype, but it's not a different phenotype. Different phenotype is like, you know, all of a sudden, I don't know. Your kidneys, you know, get become necrotic. Maybe that would be a different strain or something, but no. Back to Scotty, uh, you know, you're infected with the virus, you make an immune response, then you get a variant. He says, would, would you make antibodies to the, old, to the old virus? You would also make those. You would have a memory response to those. But as Amy said, we would also make antibodies to the new virus. Mm -hmm. In Twivo, and by the way, Nels, Nels and I will do a live stream sometime on Twivo so you, you guys can chat with him. Nels said vaccination will put strong pressure on the virus. Can you explain this? What are the implications for vaccine rollouts? Well, whenever, whenever you make an immune response to the virus, if the virus can vary, and most do, uh, it could potentially escape, like influenza does frequently, like HIV does. Uh, but, but measles does not. Yeah, measles virus does Neither not. Neither so. does polio. And we always thought that coronaviruses don't, but now a preprint from Jesse Bloom is suggesting that, in fact, it does, right, Amy? Yes. So there is a preprint from Jesse Bloom's lab, who, which is saying he collected old serum, apparently, from people who had common cold corona infections, and they don't neutralize current strains very well. Right. That's why he hypothesized, and there are variants in spike. That's why he hypothesizes yeah. you get reinfected every three years or something in that paper. Yeah. And that's yeah. something we didn't know before because no one had done the experiment. But so he says in that preprint that this could have implications for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. We may have to remake them every year or every couple of years. 
So that's the implication for vaccine rollouts. At the moment, the, the, the viruses circulating are all inhibited by antibodies produced by the vaccines, but that could change uh, in a year, for example. What but, about Paul's angry criticisms? And Paul Binash? Yeah. I think that's like point number two is where he says, you do this half-assed rolling out of the vaccine leads to, yeah. you know, yeah, this you, is the way to, this is, this is a way to really like, you know, prolong the pandemic and stuff. I think yeah, it's so the if you take phase. a long time to roll it out, right. Or if you only give one dose, right. That's another way to put, you, you allow replication of the virus in the face of an, low antibody. And that's a good way to get select for variants. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the point of his uh, thing, right. That you posted on your blog yesterday his letter that's right his letter yeah yeah is you know george gao of china cdc said we don't know the long-term effect of mrna vaccine he has an agenda of selling his inactivated vaccine but do you care to react to his critique well anybody can critique the mrna vaccine you know you could say we don't know the long-term effect yeah because we don't we have only been studying it for a year um but um, what is what I don't even understand the question because the particle comes, the nanoparticle comes, gets absorbed by the cell. You translate the mRNA into spike, and then the particle has has been destroyed, and then the mRNA gets destroyed within like what four days. So what hmm. is the long term effect? The long term oh. effect is the antibodies against spike. I don't know so if it means it effect, seems... Amy, or if it's long-lasting or what. You know, it's not clear from the wording what he's meaning. You're, you're thinking about side effects, right? Yeah, I don't under. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. What? Why? Yeah, I don't. I just don't understand the whole question. I don't understand his statement because when you sit down and you think about it, the nanoparticle, the liposome, fuses with the cell membrane. It releases its mRNA, the mRNA gets translated, process, the protein gets processed, blah, 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 gets promoted to the surface of the cell, and then it goes away. And that's all within like a week. So what is the yeah, long-term no, effect? I like think three means, months from now? No, I think he means the immune response, but maybe Le Ping can clarify if, uh, if you sure. want. I mean, I would think that the immune response against any spike-based vaccine should right. be against the immune response is against the spike, right? How long do spike antibodies last and what's the consequence of antibodies and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. Not, oh, I made it from an mRNA. Okay, fine, you made it from an mRNA. All protein are made from mRNA. What's the, I don't get it. Okay, here, look. Definitely, definitely not grumpy. Love you, Amy. Amy is delightful. I just wanted to give you a little support. It's okay. Amy. Is <laughs> it's there okay. an attenuated vaccine? Uh, there are there are some in development uh, in China, I believe, in other countries. They're making attenuated candidate vaccines by recoding. Well, the, that's the uh, ones that you know about, but I'm sure that a group at UCSF has a different plan. I'm sure he has a different plan. What do you mean? I'm sure Raul has a plan, and that recoding was not the plan. Oh, is he? Is he uh, trying? That's to make his it whole. Attenuated? Yeah, that's his interest. Is he's wants wanted to make a live attenuated infectious vaccine, and he was doing it by removing different components of the virus. You can have him on and have him talk about it. I'm sure he would love it. Oh, that's right. Now I'm re remembering this. Take out proteins and see if it's attenuated. But that's quite a ways off from a vaccine candidate, isn't it? Well, so is recoding. Yeah. So attenuated. Vaccines are not going to. It's not being supported an, by the NIH, so not, most likely it's not going to be available platform for like what five to fifteen years. Yeah, it's going to be. It's not going to make an a, a impact on this pandemic. Is what you're saying? Right? Well, it's not going to make an impact on this first wave of this pandemic. Maybe if it's still going in five years, we'll get. We can reassess. Has famotidine been proven to be effective? I think I asked Daniel Griffin this. And he wasn't aware of any evidence. Do you, do you know anything about it, Amy? 
Um, actually, I think it's been shown not to be effective. Isn't this the, isn't this what's in like pepsin p tablets yeah. or something? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's been shown not to be effective at all. It has no effect. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, you know, when Columbia had their SARS-CoV-2 symposium stuff, there was somebody who was doing it and mm -hmm. who was doing this. And then, yeah, not so good. Isn't slow rollout of vaccines putting pressure to, to escape vaccines if you have a partially immunized population? Yeah, that's... That's what Paul is writing, saying. So, so, so for virology.blog is my blog, and Paul B. Nash, a virologist at Rockefeller, I published a, an opinion by him, and he talks about this being a problem. Slow rollout will put pressure because you have low antibody population levels, and that could select for variants, yeah. What's the risk of escape with 12-week delay between shots using Pfizer vaccines as uh, recommended? 12 weeks is not is not significant. You don't think? Aren't, no. aren't you uh, allowing some infection during that time? Because the antibody, you think the antibody response is not waning. Is that right, Amy? I don't think it waned enough. If it wanes, it's not, it's, it's not statistically significant enough to be, yeah. I think when you're talking about escape units, I don't think it's even a 12-week delay. Yeah. I think if you were to say, okay, we're going to give a shot, like the MMR. We give a kid a shot at, 18, at 15 to 18 months, and then we come back at five and we inoculate them again. That's different mm -hmm. than what we do for our, like polio and DPT. We give you three shots within the first six months of life. We come back and we give you a booster at two years and then at five years. Yeah. So did, did 12 you... weeks is, I don't think 12 weeks is really a decrease of antibodies. Okay. I think the UK decided to go with one dose of AstraZeneca vaccine, by the way. Instead of oh, two. really? Yeah. I did not data. know that. They have some data after one dose. It's like 70% efficacy. And they, they decided to go with that. Okay. I'm, I'm confused because I thought it was 70% efficacy when you went with ha full dose and full dose. I didn't realize that they did one thing of just full dose. They did one full dose only. Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that I either. Did. I learned today. Yeah. Did I see didn't the know. Times Magazine article about the virus coming from a lab. You mean New York? What is it? New Yorker magazine, right? I think that's No, right. the New York Times has a Sunday magazine. And there was a, there in the past had been articles about the virus coming from a lab and from, I think, a lab in China or something or other. I mean, we've discussed this at nausea since the beginning of the pandemic. It's not from a lab. Yeah, I think also there's a, a, a article this week in New York or New Yorker, I don't remember which, by Nicholson Baker, who's a fiction writer. Who yeah, says, I know what she did, he, he has. <laughs> Angie Rasmussen tweeted it. Yeah, I know all about it. It's all ridiculous. It's not from a lab. I mean, people who think so don't really understand how science works. It's well, they really... don't understand Peter Daszak's work, which is very yes. clear, right? Very clear. Peter's, that... Peter's work is beautiful. You go, you go to the backwaters of China, you do some serology of some people, you see some antibodies to some novel things, you wait 10 years, and lo and behold, you have a pandemic. That pretty much is the summary. We don't need all the details. I don't know. What do you think of this? When women get critical, it's called grumpy? No, you're called grumpy too. It's anybody who's critical. Yeah, because I've critical is critical grumpy. is where you say, I don't really think that that is the right interpretation. And people say you're being negative and they take it all personal and... You, you're, be, you're told you're difficult or argumentative, and all you're saying is, wait a minute, if you sit down and think about the biology, I'm confused because here's what we know, here's what doesn't change, and here's what you're telling me, and it's based on the fact that this thing that you told me that we all agree on that doesn't change is changing. doesn't make any sense. It used to be I was called fussy. 
but as you know, Amy, I've been called grumpy also for being critical, right? Yes, I'm the one who taught you to be grumpy. Yeah, it's true. How many years ago was that? <laughs> Five years ago? I don't know. Probably when I was your graduate student, I was grumpy then too. I was very critical. Would you classify That's the it. variant as a variant and not a strain? Yes, it's a variant right now. It's not a strain yet, even though the mainstream media will call it a strain because they don't know what they're talking about. That's fine. But um, uh, uh, Kosovo, in the article in the New York wow. Times, Dr. Griffin says lower CT means severe disease. Okay. Not means, but a lower, in, in a few studies on admission, if you had a lower CT, which means more viral RNA, and a nasopharyngeal swab, it's it's associated with a more severe disease outcome, higher mortality, all right? And it, it, so this is one reason that Dr. Griffin and others want the CT from the PCR test. They don't want to just hear positive or negative. They want to know the CT so they could use it in their clinical management of the patients. So we actually uh, talked a little bit about that on TWIV today. I'm sure you'll talk about it tomorrow when you talk to Daniel. Is it right to use S-gene dropouts to monitor the variant? Yeah, I never problem. like negative PCRs because you never know why you have a negative. Yeah. If the, if it's really not there or, if you, or you forgot to add polymerase. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's kind of, they should, they should do something to make it a positive result, as Amy says. Now, they have sequenced a lot of these isolates and they confirm that the... Yeah, but there only needs to be them. one. Yeah. It only needs not to work once, right? Yeah. It's just a personal preference. I yeah. personally don't like negative absence of bounds. Yeah, but... you have to, folks, you know very well that when you come and hear us on this live stream, a lot of it is our opinions. But we do base it on science, right, Amy? Oh, really? That's what I'm supposed to base it on? Really? <laughs> Now, she's oh. joking, folks. She's joking, okay? I could have sworn I was going to base it on something else, but okay. What have we learned about the science. risk of antibody-dependent enhancement? I suppose you mean with SARS-CoV-2, right? So we have not seen any so far in all the vaccine tests, right, Amy? Right. I'm not aware of anything that and has what suggested we do know, that. We... And this is an important point. You, you typically get antibody-dependent enhancement when you make non-neutralizing antibodies against your virus because they will bind the virus. It will then get into some other cell by an FC receptor. Uh, and um, then that virus will reproduce. So the antibody can't be neutralizing. We know these vaccines are inducing high levels of neutralizing antibodies. So I, my, from my view, it's not a concern for me. ADC. Well, I don't think it has to be, and I, I don't think it has to be vaccine dependent. Oh, no, 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 of course not. But I was going to say because antibody enhanced disease dependent uh, enhanced no, no, no. disease classically is getting dengue serotype two and or four, yeah, get yeah, them all these confused, and getting the other one secondary, right. and that's yeah, natural infection. But, but people are concerned about it in the context of vaccination, COVID vaccination. I, you're absolutely right; it happens naturally. Yeah, I think that like. And did a lot of with these, the Dengvaxia vaccine, right? It did happen with that. It did, but that happens with the natural course of disease. Yes, yes. I think so that SARS, we're... SARS and SARS-CoV-2 in humans, no evidence for ADE, right? In I'm humans. not even aware of it I'm, for this virus. I mean, the papers for ADE in mice with SARS are very iffy, if best. For the cat feline coronavirus, I will agree to it. For this virus, I don't even see it where um, it's even alluded to in Barracks or Stanley Perlman's models. So I don't, or anybody else's models, I don't see it. But I think like, it's kind of like another excuse. Like you didn't hear, oh, we might have ADE when you give HPV vaccines. Where mm -hmm. was that discussion? Uh, can you talk about the range of interval time a vaccine can be given between dose one and two and what would be the effect on efficacy? So we talked a little bit about this earlier. It's my understanding you don't want to put them too close, otherwise you'll get interference. But Amy thinks that a month is fine. 
um, if you go too far away, you risk getting infected, right? If you wait a year <laughs> before the second dose, then in that year you could get the natural infection. So you have to time it in some way to prevent. And, and if, you know, right now SARS-CoV-2 is prevalent. It, there's a lot of it around, so you want to immunize as quickly as possible. But if you're in New Jersey and you're getting a measles vaccine and there's no measles around, then obviously you can wait longer, right? You don't have to get that boost right away. No, so it's just the, I don't know. I think that it has to do with study design. That's true I think also. that it was most, yeah. uh, I think it was convenient for study design for them to say, we're going to give you one dose and then we're going to give you one dose three or six, four yes. weeks later, yes. because yes. they didn't go and do a study and say, we gave you one dose and we came back two months later. Like, when yeah, you have, yeah. as I said, when you're a child and you get DPT and polio, you used to get them together when I worked for the pediatrician and you came in as a kid and you got them at two, four and six months. And then you got it again at two years old. But I don't believe that the studies were designed or even asked those questions. So, Amy, you're right, because this we're in a time crunch and you don't want the study to go out a long time. So you do a very short interval between dose one and two, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, basically. UK says three months for the second shot. Yeah. 12 weeks. Is this wise? And Amy thinks it's okay, right? I don't see where there's a lot of data that says after natural infection that the titers really decreased by like 70% between in three months. Yeah, I agree. I think so I, 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 like, if they decrease 5%, I'm not sure that that's... However, it's not been tested. So in the U.S., the FDA wouldn't allow that because they give out the EUA based on the data you give them. And if you then come back later and say, we want to change it, they'll say, well, then give us more data. You can't just do it in the U.S., but apparently in the U.K., you can change it after the, the study is done. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not to I, I believe you. I'm just not into the administrative ways of running a trial. That's not what I do. It's not got something the, I'm going to focus on. I got the MMR on. vaccine last week. Great. That's good. It could give you some protection. Those, the paper we did on TWIV some time ago was quite interesting. And, and getting MMR is not going to harm, so it's not bad. What do you think about people in West Virginia who are given Regeneron's monoclonal instead of Moderna vaccine? Would they be doubly protected? No. no. It's, it's totally it's, different. Totally different. I mean, the, Darna, the Regeneron monoclonals will last two months, Amy? How long would the uh, I thought it was two or three months. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's not allowing your immune system to generate a response. Right. You're not going to have memory. The vaccine so, will right. give you memory. Well, you're, yeah, I don't know what you're going to have, but you're not having anything. Um. So I don't know why you would do that instead of giving any vaccine. I don't understand what, what the yeah. logic was no. because it's totally different. Yep. So I, I don't get it. But, you know, I didn't really understand when, you know, some people in the government got monoclonal antibodies and then were tested 48 hours later and, pe and their physician came out and said, oh, look, he developed an antibody response. It's like, no, you're asking the antibodies that were he was given 48 hours ago. <laughs> you do know what I'm talking about. Of course, Amy. You and I talk so, about this all the time. So I don't really know exactly. Yeah, so I don't really. 94% efficacy was relative to serious illness. Right. Against serious illness. Um, what do you mean not getting it at all? You not mean, getting infected. Well, no, we don't know that because they didn't check. All they know is. No serious illness. Those people might still have been infected. Right, Amy? Right. Moderna's doing the study. And now. This, this, is, this question is related. If the vaccine doesn't confer sterilizing immunity, can a vaccinated individual become infected and transmit? It's possible. Yeah, we don't mm -hmm. know what the effect the vaccines are having on actual infection. Fellow docs had a debate. Any reason for or against getting COVID immunization number two in the same or different arm? <laughs> yeah, I heard, I heard someone ask me this today by uh, or the other day by email. What do you, so the idea would be the 
if you do the same arm, you, you hit the same lymph nodes, right, Amy? And then you. Yes, but I was just thinking that if I hurt, if they did my right arm and it hurt as much or worse than my left arm for the second shot, being right-handed, I'd not be pleased. Yeah, so I hear they're giving it <laughs> the same arm because it is a local uh, lymph node where the, uh, the the mRNA nanoparticles go. So I don't think it goes systemic, does it, Amy? The I don't think so. The mRNA vaccine, so... No, yeah. I don't believe it does. It's not enough. So uh, these people who got the monoclonals were given the Moderna vaccine later. Hopefully, yeah, that's Okay, good. sounds good, but hopefully the they were given it like several months after their antibody treatment. It would not be good to give it right after the antibody treatment. You have to, I believe that Daniel has discussed this and said like you yeah. needed to wait 90 days. Florida has no plan for a second dose. Okay, I'm not surprised. I am actually, because I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know that states could change EUAs. In this in this world, uh, states seem to be able to do whatever they want. No, I don't know. I take the fifth. How do we tell whether the vaccine is reducing spread? You'd have to do a trial and measure it. And Moderna is planning to do that this year on college campuses. So we will know in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Is using a bike instead of riding a bus a good way to avoid coronavirus? Yes. You bet. Less exposure. Always reducing probability of being exposed by somebody. Is the new variant less lethal? Not clear. Yeah, not clear. All right, so back to the Griffin article. The more severe disease with lower CT, doesn't this mean that the variant is more pathogenic as we see a lower CT there? Not necessarily. It's an association. So you, you can't say that that... I understand what you're saying, but... You, it's, well, I don't, considering the fact I could have wild type at a CT value of 11, like Ian and Nishi, and I could have variant at a CT value of 11. So what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, so I, I I guess I don't really understand. So in the, in the paper we did on TWIFT today, they say 22 could be, CT of 22 could be the cutoff. If you're 22 or below on admission, you're more likely to have serious COVID. And um, I mean, these, these variants have one to two CT difference. So I'm not sure that would make a difference anyway. Is there anything new in the New York Magazine article that they published? New York Magazine, right? Not the New Yorker. No, there's nothing new. It's all the same arguments that have been rehashed over and over that we've talked about. Um, so I, I just don't get it. Listen to Twiv archives. <laughs> Can you give an estimate for how many particles are assembled in each cell and how long it takes? Uh, so I don't know how many. Well, I don't think that anybody has done that on a per cell basis, number one. Plus, you don't know what the ratio of interfering defective particles is to infectious particles. Um, but I think by the neat growth curves initially, I think that replication is about 24 hours yeah i think that's full replication i think susan, susan also said the same thing yeah, yeah 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 how confident are we that an infected person who is not infectious in culture by a black assay can really not transmit the virus how confident would you be amy if we took a nasal swab of me and you didn't find virus that i could not transmit so a plaque assay level of detection is 100 PFU per ml because that's 10 plaques on an undiluted plate, right? So I'm unclear that uh, 100 PFU is enough to initiate an infection. And from mm -hmm. some of the animal, and 
while animal work that Barak did is not humans, if you extrapolate it, I don't believe that that was in the ballpark of for the mouse. But I'd have to go back and check. So the ferret paper we did today, which you sent me. Yeah, I know, because I thought that the title was outrageous. 500 PFU did not infect ferrets, but um, I think 10,000, 100,000 and a million did. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, about but that, the level of detection, right. But the level of detection of a plaque assay, as I just said, I do all the time. My time's zero, undiluted, 10 plaques. Yeah. 100 pla 10 plaques, put down on the chart, 100 PFU per ml. Move on to the next time point. Russia has said vaccine shipping can have alcohol for a month before and several days after. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Have you? No, but I can ask Andrew. Because <laughs> if it has to do with not drinking, he would know. Uh, someone asked today on TWIV whether you should get a good night's sleep before the vaccine. You know, in general, you should get good sleep and have healthy habits. But one night of sleeping well is not going to make a difference. <laughs> I'm still looking for my good night's sleep at, you know, 55 years old here. You know, Why does the second whatever. dose usually induce more side effects than the first? Because you're getting a nice memory response. And um, you're getting, it's it's more intense than the first dose. And that's why you're getting a better reaction. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. And then I have to go do plaque assays and split cells. You think OxyContin scandal is making people avoid getting vaccinated? I think people. No, it is held get... accountable. Is held accountable if something goes dramatically wrong. Yeah. Well, I think people who don't want to be immunized can use any number of excuses. That could be one of them. Um, so, but I don't know. It's not really. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to apply that. Yeah. So like, is the idea that if you have a detrimental effect to the vaccine, that when you go to sue the vaccine manufacturer, they will not hold that, that company accountable. I mean, the thing about Oxycontin is that they knew that it was addicting and that they actually kind of, I think had an anecdote to that addiction and they particularly withheld that information and then pushed the pharmacies or the physicians to continuously prescribe something to get the people addicted. This I don't so I don't know what the analogy is. Like what would be the analogy? So I gave you a vaccine, knowing that I'm gonna give you the disease or that you're gonna die. I don't I don't I, I, unless they're I'm giving you the vaccine with a known detrimental effect. I'm not sure that there's the, I'm not sure what the, anal the, the analogous situation is. When do you think the U.S. will get AstraZeneca? When they finish their comparative study. Isn't that the one that you said was like now doing it with Sputnik because you mm -hmm. have to have standard of care? Yeah. That's comparing so, it against Sputnik, which is the Russian yeah. vaccine, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what is that? Have they enrolled anybody? I think they're enrolling. Yeah, that's going to be a while for the AstraZeneca. It could be that the Novavax comes out earlier if that works out. I think Novavax well, I don't see that this. I don't see this coming out until, I don't know, maybe next fall. Really? Well, yeah, if they're just starting to enroll. But so is Novavax. They just started last week, so they could be done in two months. What's okay. the matter? There's a lot of cases still. Yes, there's a lot of cases and then there's still and then there's a lot of people getting vaccinated. We're not efficient at it yet, but hopefully we will <laughs> be efficient at some point in the next two months. I mean, we're very efficient vaccinating our freezers. They're wonderfully protected. <laughs> Don't need to worry about my minus 80 getting SARS-CoV-2 infections. Us, not so good. Go and take one more. Okay, one more. Then I have might, to go. might we never find the virus in bats that led to SARS-CoV-2 because it no longer exists in bats? And all we can find are viruses with common ancestors or viruses that have SARS-CoV-2 as an ancestor. Well, there's three different questions in there, right? So 
we might never find it because we might never be able to go back to China since we've burned so many <laughs> bridges. Right. Not a good plan. Um, it could be a recombinant of multiple viruses, right? Like SARS was a recombinant of multiple viruses, right? We didn't actually find that there's not one ancestor. It's multiple, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the third, the last part is that, are we going to find the ancestor to SARS, but will we find SARS CoV-2 as being the ancestor to potentially the next pandemic? Well, if we were monitoring, for sure, we would be able to trace SARS CoV 2 yeah. today and look how it's circulating in the bat, right? And then, you know, go and do serology on the people who are constantly exposed, as I said, that Peter does, right? So elegantly. But since we're not in China and there's no surveillance, good luck to you. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ancestor to SARS 1 was found, they found in civets and then bats something very very close but the closest we have to SARS-CoV-2 is from 2013 so that's obviously not the immediate ancestor there's something more proximal and we don't know unless as Amy says we have to be able to do surveillance otherwise we'll never find it right but the third part of the question is will SARS-CoV-2 be the ancestor to some something else and that surveillance will tell you how it's evolving yeah. in the bat right yeah I mean, but it's since we SARS CoV two has gone back into bats and other animals, right? Right. So the pro from... so unless you sur do surveillance and you kind of try and make some connection to the serology changes in the pop in the human population that's in that area, you mm -hmm. really you know you don't know. But that's what we should be doing. Exactly. But we're not. Exactly. Thank you, Amy. All right. I have to go do some plaque assays. They're calling. See you next week. Well, I'll we'll see, see you it. sooner, but uh, everyone else will see you next week. Thank you so much, Amy. My pleasure. You're, we're, we're chatting tomorrow. We're getting antibodies tomorrow, right? Yeah, we're we'll going chat through tomorrow. the catalog. Yeah, we'll chat tomorrow. Gotta go through the catalog. Okay. And I have to get some isolates, too. All right. I okay. gotta go. Bye. Okay, I'll stick around to 9.30. Will the fact that we had less flu this year affect the flu season next year? It's a good question. I think so, because normally what happens is you have the strains migrating from north, northern to southern hemispheres it's because their, their winters alternate, right? So when we have winter here in the north, Northern Hemisphere, they have summer in the south and vice versa. And influenza is a winter disease in temperate climates anyway. So the next season strains come from the other hemisphere. And so since uh, flu seasons in both have been impacted, it could make next year's different in some way. I don't know exactly what. There would be less variation there will probably still be a season next year, especially since we won't be distancing and masking and so forth because the flu viruses are always circulating. We just don't see them all the time. Does the mRNA activate T-cell immunity? Yes, it does. That's been measured in each of the trials, phase one, two, and three. I mean, what's been the focus has been measuring antibody immunity, right? But they also measured CD4 positive, virus-specific CD4 positive T-cells and they are induced by the vaccine. We're not sure of their role in protection, though. Yeah, those experiments haven't been done. <clears throat> How do I think of a T cell test versus an antibody test? So, uh, antibody tests are relatively easy to do, T cell tests are harder to do. You have to have peptides, you know, short peptides that you. Uh, load onto T cells and culture. And so it's not as as easy to do on a mass scale. And so that's why we're mainly doing uh, antibody tests. T cell tests are typically done for research purposes on smaller populations, but they're both important and they should both be measured for sure. Could common cold coronavirus immunity protect against COVID-19? So there is there are some people who think so. There was a paper published in Science last month, which we discussed on TWIV, which 
uh, hypothesize just that. They think that uh, immunity induced by common cold coronaviruses uh, is protective, and kids who are better protected against disease seem to have more antibodies to common cold corona. I think it needs to be more fleshed out, but it is a possibility for sure. However, you know, we all are infected on a yearly basis, or at least every few years, by common cold coronaviruses, yet we're getting SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I'm not quite sure it's that straightforward, right? AstraZeneca, yeah, we had this screw up with the full and half dose, and so they paused in the UK. They resumed and finished in the UK, but they never resumed in the US, I understand. And then they, when they decided to resume, they said, well, we should really, since there are now already two mRNA vaccines with EUAs, we should test our vaccine against Sputnik. So I think that's what they're doing. Virology 2021, the first lecture will be uh, Monday. I'll probably post it on Tuesday next week which is, uh, what's the date? Today is the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, January 12th. Uh, some people are saying the UK or South African variant is spreading faster in children. I just don't think you can say that. Well, I think that there are infections happening in children and they, they happen to be occurring with the variant. So that's why you see the variant enriched. I don't know why. I mean, school is resumed, right, after the holidays, so that might be part of it. I'm not convinced that there's any biological difference in kids with this variant. That's that's a possibility, but I don't see the data for it. Is hydroxychloroquine going to be ironically effective for some long haul haulers if it is autoantibodies? I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure people would look at it because it's been so maligned, right? But it's possible, sure. Why, do, why does the CRISPR defense system not attack the mRNA vaccine? Because uh, we, don't, we don't have CRISPR defense systems naturally. It's only in bacteria and archaea. We use, we use them, right? We repurpose CRISPR defense system, but we don't have them ourselves. We do have RNA-based defenses. Um, but what we do is we package the mRNA vaccines in a lipid coat, right? We deliver them to the cells in our, in our arm. They get taken up into the cells. And certainly there's an immune response against them. There's an innate response, but the, they're also translated rapidly and make protein so that they can be sensed by the immune system. So it's kind of a race, and the, and the vaccine wins that race. <laughs> okay. Um, can you explain what a stereo, stereo, serotype, not stereotype? I'm a stereotypic scientist, right? Actually, I'm not because I do social media, so most scientists don't. Uh, sorry. What's a serotype versus a strain versus a mutation? So let's take mutation first. A mutation is a change in the nucleic acid of any organism. It could be us, humans, or it could be birds or flies, worms, or viruses. A mutation is a base change or a deletion or an insertion. Okay, it's not an amino acid change. That's that's a change in the protein sequence. Mutation is nucleic acid. A serotype is uh, a virus that differs from another vi closely related virus in that it's not neutralized by antibodies against the other virus. So let's take poliovirus, which is a simple example. There are three serotypes of polio that used to circulate, and they all cause paralysis. And if you, made, if you were immunized with serotype 1, you would make antibodies against it, but those antibodies would not protect you against serotype 2. Absolutely no protection, nor serotype 3. So that's why the polio vaccines have all three serotypes in them. And as far as we know, there's one serotype of SARS-CoV-2. So what is a strain? A strain is a variant of a virus that has some different biological property that has been shown. Um, and so far, you know, I think there's one strain of SARS-CoV-2. If one were identified that had markedly different biological transmission properties, it could be a, a different strain, but I don't think that's been shown yet. Uh, 
Um, at what point are we going to stop calling them? Well, I could call the uh, the UK virus the B one 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 seven, right, and the South African another one. Uh, and Steen, you would know what I'm talking about, but would everyone else? Um, but I was never the uh, I, I I wasn't the first to do that, and as you know. People don't like calling viruses after where they came from because it kind of insults the point of origin. So I would agree. <coughs> I would um, stick with the numbers. The, you, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the virus from South Africa, which I have to say because I have to, you have to know what I'm talking about, has a markedly different number. It's quite long. <clears throat> <coughs> sorry, folks. Sorry for coughing. Does the structure of S change <clears throat> if there's a few deletions of, I guess you mean amino acids, right? <clears throat> it depends. Depends where in the protein they are. They could be in a critical place and cause a conformational change, or they could be buried and not cause any change. So yes, yes or no, depending on where they are. <clears throat> Yeah, I know what you mean. Purportedly over allegedly. That's fine. <clears throat> you think allegedly has crime inferences, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I think you should use purportedly. But as you know, mainstream media has concluded that it's uh, more transmissible. So I've lost that battle. Ah, do you think in high school biology students should be taught virology? <clears throat> yeah, I do. And I go to high school, my local high school, once a year and teach them some virology. Um, would you believe that not every college has a virology course? Not every college student learns virology? I mean, at Columbia, I teach virology. I get 120, 130 students a year, but there are thousands more that don't take my course. I think that's crazy. They should. And this is here is the best reason why they should be taking virology. Here's another reason, not just because viruses are important. It's a <clears throat> integrative subject, which means when you study viruses, you don't just learn about the virus. You learn about biochemistry, cell biology, you learn about immunology. You, you can learn about epidemiology, even sociology, how populations interact and spread viruses. So you can learn a lot of things, and it makes them make sense, right? So I have had students come up to me after my virology course and say, you know, I took biology and it didn't make sense, and now that I've taken vi virology, biology makes sense. So virology put viruses put everything in contact. That's what... Um, that's what I think. <laughs> South Africa. I, I have to get the number. I, I do have the paper here, but I don't want to spend time looking it up. Next time, next week's live stream, I will call them by the right variant numbers. Okay, folks. Uh, South Africa, but for now we'll call it South Africa variant <clears throat> relating to the vaccine. So, so far, the changes in both the UK, uh, let's say B1117 variant and the South African variant, um, those changes do not seem to affect neutralization by antibody. Therefore, they shouldn't impact vaccine, which is not to say in the future that a virus won't arise that does impact the vaccine efficacy. We just have to keep our eyes out for it. <laughs> yes, Amy is allegedly grumpy. Very good. Ostensibly is a final alternative. Yeah, ostensibly or um, what was the one? Purportedly. Those work for me, yeah. <clears throat> About new variant identification, isn't sequencing the length run critical rather than assembling? <clears throat> well, they they first pick it up by this dropout PCR where they don't get the fragment because the, the binding site is compromised. And then they can sequence it as well. I don't really know if, if run length would make a difference. To be honest, if sorry, Amy isn't here. She would she would know that. <clears throat> I was told that not all virologists agree on what constitutes a variant versus a strain. 
whereas mutation is clearly distinct. So uh, look, I have my own views. I've been working on viruses for 40 years. I wrote a textbook. It's in its fifth edition. So I have to know definitions, and I can't be wishy-washy. I know a lot of virologists who call changes in proteins mutations, and they're not. So I know what a variant is. I know what a strain is. I know what a mutation is. Yeah, you're right. Not every virologist knows. And why? Because there's no standards for training virologists. Everyone's trained in a different lab, and depending on the PI, you learn it right or you don't. If you're trained in my lab, you'll know what these things mean. Like, talk to Amy. She trained in my lab. My lab. She knows what all these, these terms mean. <clears throat> How can we determine whether a current vaccine will work against emerging variants? So what you do is you get the variant in the lab, you grow it up, and then you take serum from a person who's been immunized with the vaccine, and you see if the serum blocks infection of cells in the lab by the variant. It's a very standard way to do it, and we can quickly know whether any change in a variant will uh, impact vaccine efficacy. A question about CD8 CTL production in activated versus genetic ad vaccines. <clears throat> Is the expression of the antigen in body cells required, or can the immune system be tricked? Yeah, you can You can have inactivated vaccines or subunit vaccines that are adjuvanted that can induce uh, CTLs because they can be processed and presented properly. So, yes, you don't need to have an infectious vaccine. Number of B-cell and T-cell epitopes in the spike. Uh, no, I just know that there are 20 combined. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the breakdown between B and T. And um, uh, I, I could look it up, but I don't know it offhand. I'm sorry. Vincent seems to have faith in the new admin. No, I, I'll be critical of the new administration. The, the point is that there hasn't been a federal directive in this pandemic, and so hopefully we can improve. It may not. And you can bet I'll be just as critical as this admin as the last one if they screw up, for sure. <clears throat> How did the polybasic furin cleavage site get into SARS-CoV-2? So Andrew Rambo, who I re greatly respect in terms of his uh, genomics expertise, thinks it came from another bat virus. So somehow we're out there. Uh, there is a bat virus with a polybasic cleavage site. Now, we haven't seen many of them. There was just one identified last year, a bat isolate SARS-like virus with a polybasic cleavage site. And he thinks the pressure came uh, uh, in a bat somewhere else. But, of course, we need to do more surveillance to, to figure that out. <clears throat> Uh, WHO virus mission blunted as China refuses team entry. Yeah, that's the problem. They don't let people go in who are going to be uh, surveilling uh, the wildlife. Um, <clears throat> I hope that changes. I really do, because we need to have international cooperation, right? If people have survive a severe COVID case, would you recommend them taking all prior vaccines because of the germinal centers possibly getting wiped out? I don't think so at this point. So the germinal center wipeout was in patients who died. And we have no idea if it's in patients who survive. And anyway, even if they were wiped out in, in less severe COVID, you should still have memory B cells in your bone marrow uh, from prior infections. The problem with measles infection is it wipes those out. And then you have to get newly vaccinated. Can non-human cell lines that are used for virus productions increase viral pathogenicity through mutations? It, it could in theory, but that's why you have to test the vaccine that you produce. You make it and you test it to make sure it is not causing disease. Now, of course, if you're making a an mRNA vaccine, this is irrelevant, right? Because the mRNA vaccine is made uh, in vitro transcription. There are no cells involved there. And protein-based vaccines, same idea. So... One concern might be the adenovirus vectors, but they, they are non-replicating. Most of them are non-replicating. They're delivering a gene that's then produced. So this could be an issue, say, in an infectious attenuated vaccine, but that's why we test them. <clears throat> yeah. 
news report on South, um, sorry, news report on South African variants said antibodies from a previous infection were 10 times less effective. So I, I want to see the data for that. I don't want to depend on a news report, okay, because I don't trust that they're going to get it right. Um, and I want to know what kind of antibody. Is it a single monoclonal antibody? In which case, it doesn't bother me because there are 20 epitopes, B and T cell epitopes. And if one changes, that that is uh, not a problem. Now, if it's polyclonal serum from an immunized or infected person, that would be more concerning. I don't know what number is, is a problem, right? The mink variants were also less neutralized by human convalescent serum, but I don't know how that translates to human infections. I would say you get concerned, and you have to decide at some point what number, what 10x number you're going to look at and say, oh, we have to change the vaccine. I definitely think you need to keep an eye on it. Yeah. <clears throat> What can explain the discrepancy between viral load and disease, disease severity? I don't know exactly what you mean. The, the, what we talked about earlier is that uh, it, on admission to hospital, if you have a CT value of 22 or less, that means a lot of RNA, you have a, poor or, a poorer prognosis for recovery. So what could explain that if that's what you're asking? Well... <clears throat> You get some people, for whatever reason, the virus replicates the higher titers in their upper tract, and maybe that allows it to more readily invade the lower tract and drive this uh, inflammatory syndrome. That's a hypothesis that some people have. So they may have a poorer immune response to it. If we have an infection rate of 10%, why haven't we achieved herd immunity yet? Well, the infection rate varies according to where you are. And... Um, I think the herd immunity level is very hard to achieve by natural infection, especially if people, well, you know, I originally thought the herd immunity needed was 50 to 70 percent, but Tony Fauci's now raised it over 90 percent. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can explain that. Maybe that the 10 percent is not correct. Can you comment on findings that uh, SARS-CoV-2 was found in European patients in November? I I don't believe that. Be well, someone someone on an earlier live stream said March 2019, so I don't believe that because that's probably a PCR error of some kind. November 2019, if it's real, that could that's feasible because I think it was circulating in China in in November and it could have already spread elsewhere. But I'd have to see how it was picked up because you have to really be con careful of contamination if it's a PCR-based analysis. Or if it's serum, um, then you have to be careful about it being specific assay, right? Yeah, yeah Nels and I will do some live streams. We'll live stream a, a t maybe a Twivo episode where you can listen in and answer, ask some questions and so forth. And Nels is really excited about that. I think Nels would be perfect for, for a live stream. Why have mRNA vaccines been the primary focus in contrast to uh, attenuated ones? What advantages do mRNA vaccines bring to the table? It's a great question. Someone asked me the other day, why didn't we make an inactivated vaccine in the U.S.? You know, we have so many inactivated vaccines like flu vaccines and polio vaccines. You would think they would just do it. But I think well, your question is about an attenuated vaccine. I think uh, any any vaccine that involves making a lot of viruses is, is problematic, at least in the U.S., because you have to do it in a BSL-3 facility. So growing hundreds of thousands of liters of virus-infected cells on its own is hard, and that can be done. But then if you do it in a BSL-3, it's even harder. So I think that drove some of the interest in mRNA and adenovirus vaccines, because the adeno vaccines don't have to be grown in a BSL-3. Now, of course, in China, they did grow and produce an inactivated vaccine, so obviously it wasn't a concern to them, but I think it would be here. And the mRNA vaccines had been tested for, for a number of years before SARS-CoV-2 emerged, and they were showing some promise in animals. And the, they, they were very attractive because you could do them very quickly, right? In January, they got the sequence of spike, and they could immediately start making 
the mRNA make the lipid nanoparticles and start testing them in, in animals and then in, in people. So I think the flexibility and the ability to pivot with those vaccines played a big role in having them move to the front. <clears throat> Brian said on EM Rapid that there was a 2013 phase one where patients received mRNA vaccine. Yeah, it was for a different virus, of course, but I don't know about the the date, but I, I believe that's correct. If she says that's correct, I will believe her. Do any of you know about the 42-year-old nurse in the Portugal who had no underlying conditions, was vaccinated, and then died? Regardless, I will get vaccinated. I don't know anything about that. You have to be careful about these um, anecdotal things because things happen to people in, in life, right? And if you happen to be vaccinated, then you have this uh, you know, desire to associate it, but it's not always correct. Would it be better to build up a large supply and somewhat synchronize its administration among the world? Well, in an ideal situation, you'd love to do that, but we can't. We have many nations making vaccines and sharing them or not sharing them, right? So I don't think we have the luxury of doing that in this case. So do you know why there are different amounts, why different amounts are inoculated? Uh, that's what they did in the in the trials. You know, they did a dosing trial initially, and they each decided which gave the optimal immune response. And they are formulated differently, and that may have something to do with it. But I don't know the answer. I'm, I assume we're going to see the answer in a publication in the future. How much mRNA is not encapsulated? So... <clears throat> That's a good question. I don't know the answer whether they purify the nanoparticles at all in some way. Uh, and, but the, the reason is, can having naked RNA in the bloodstream cause any effects? So remember, these are inoculated into the muscle. So uh, not some will get into the bloodstream. Um, but uh, And yes, they could cause uh, an interferon response. And some people have genetic predisposition to what are called interferonopathies. They make over-exuberant interferon responses, so they could be a problem with them. Um, but, you know, and all the people that have received these so far, it hasn't seemed to be an issue. <clears throat> Does the mRNA vaccine-induced S protein stop or continue indefinitely? No, it only lasts a few days, as Amy said earlier. I think two to four days, and they can no longer detect the mRNA. So it's ter it's translated for some time, and then the mRNA turns over. No mRNA lasts forever, and so it's gone. So there's no long-term uh, issue there. Does the proportion of structural viral proteins produced by an infected cell match their proportion in the virions? No. Of course, it depends on the virus, but... Um, many, many viruses produce a, an abundance of structural proteins, um, and the, the number of virions, the infected, infectious virus particles can differ. So there's no direct proportionality. It really depends on the virus and even the cell that the virus is reproducing in. What's your opinion of BioNTech working with Russia to combine their vaccine with Sputnik V? Are they thinking one donor? I don't know. I haven't heard of this. Um, I will look into it. Maybe, yeah, I don't know why they would do that because the Sputnik is two different adenovirus vectors, of course, for the prime and the boost, so it doesn't have any cross-reactivity issues. So i um, <clears throat> not sure what they're thinking of, but I haven't seen that story. Sorry. There's an original antigenic sin and issue with getting the vaccine and getting infected later down the road. So original, I, I, I presume you're asking in the context of SARS-CoV-2. 
So original antigenic sin, you get it's typically observed with influenza virus, but you can see it with other virus. You get infected with a, a, a variant of influenza virus. We can call it a strain because it has a different antibody profile reactivity. So you get infected with strain one, and then years later you get infected with a different strain two. You will have an immune response to the original strain, and those antibodies may not help you with the new infection. So uh, this was this would be an issue if SARS-CoV-2 varied antigenically, and it might. So far we haven't seen it, but it could down the road. So yeah, it might be an issue. Unrelated to COVID, we borrowed 21 balloons and my second grader finished a great book, The 21 Balloons. Yep, I have it right here on my shelf. There are a number of preprints claiming the new variants can resist vaccines. I don't think that's correct. I have not seen that. I have seen preprints saying that they don't resist the vaccines. There's one amino acid change at 501 in B1117. Hey, Steen, see, I'm going B1117. And uh, it seems to be okay, so I haven't seen that. Again, single amino acid changes, in my view, are not likely to be of importance to a polyclonal vaccine response. Um, multiple changes could be an issue, but we haven't seen them. On the long-term effects of mRNA vaccines, since some develop anti-interferon antibodies with COVID, do you think it's possible for the vaccine to cause that? No, I think you answered your question. Do we know why some develop anti-interferon antibodies? We don't know. Um, and it may, <clears throat> I mean, t typically what virus is damaging something in the body and that leads to self-antibody antibody production against self-antigens. And so if it's just spike, it's not likely to do that. But I'm, I don't know the answer. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. It's very, very interesting questions. Yeah, and also following up, there are also preprints claiming the new variants are more transmissive. So the the methods they're using are bioinformatic, and computational, and epidemiological. <clears throat> and so my point of view, and that of many other virologists who agree with me, is that if you think that there's the changes in the virus are causing the transmission changes, you, you have to show that. From a public health standpoint, uh, I can understand the concern, but Really, what are you going to do if it is, if you think it's more transmissible, you wear face masks, you distance, you do all the things that, that you're supposed to be doing anyway. From a virological viewpoint, I'm very interested to see if, if a virus can increase, the transmissibility of a virus can increase, and I haven't seen the biological proof yet. And so that's why I'm interested in that, and I don't think that you can conclude that, you, you can conclude in these outbreaks, this variant seems to be, spreading to a lot of people, but there are other reasons to explain that other than it, the biological changes in the virus. Yeah, so this is the article in New York Magazine that the virus was being worked on in the lab. This is, you know why this is wrong? Because where did they get the virus? So they're saying it came from this 2013 bad isolate, and they were working on it in the lab. The 2013 isolate is over 2,000 bases different from SARS-CoV-2. They're not going to fix all those base changes in the lab so that it looks like SARS-CoV-2. They're scattered throughout the whole genome. So to think that the 2013 virus is they were working on and it became SARS-CoV-2 is just not understanding genomics of viruses. Absolutely not. Okay, so now you're coming back. We can't rule out risks with COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Yeah, well, as I've said before, so far they look pretty not risky and it's your choice uh between a risky disease and a vaccine, that seems okay. But here's what I tell people. Look, if you're worried about risks, just wait a few months. Actually, you're not going to get a vaccine for a few months anyway. At least I'm not. And by then, we're going to have more safety data. So it's not really an issue, I think. <clears throat> you think a vaccine will last 12 months. 
I have no way of knowing. Um, natural infection, according to Shane Crotty, seems to last for years by their calculations. So the vaccine could, but nobody really knows. We just have to wait and see. He said, we've only been studying mRNA for so long. Yeah, well, as I said, it's been in, in people since 2013, so we have that, although small numbers of people. I don't know what the long-term risk would be because it's pretty transient a treatment. It's there and it's gone in a couple of days. So I'm not, um, I'm not worried, too worried about it. Can I get Xi Zhongli of, oh, what Wuhan Institute of Virology. So here's the thing. Back in 2019, December, I went to Singapore and did five TWIBs there. And I met some students and they said, we're going to invite you to Wuhan next year and you can do a TWIB. So I was going to go in 2020 and of course that couldn't happen. So I'm hoping to be able to go at some point. And yeah, I'd love to go. Now I could probably get her on TWIV by uh, Zoom or something like that. Is this pandemic leading to more research into immune response and regulation? Yes, a lot of uh, immunologists have switched to studying COVID-19 immunology. So yeah, it has. I, I hope it continues. Outside of a vaccine, how do you defeat the virus and infect the person? So if you're already infected, a vaccine is not going to help you, right? Uh, so you have to, well, right now we don't have good ways of treating infection. I mean, the monoclonals, if given very early, can prevent infections, but uh, they're often not given early. They're given to people on admission or slightly before admission. Uh, they're trying to change that, but that's really all we have at this point. And um, it's really unfortunate that we haven't gotten more. Why are you not considering DNA versus mRNA vaccines? Because DNA vaccines were tested for years in, in people and they didn't work. Many uh, HIV DNA-based vaccines were tested. There are some DNA vaccines in use in uh, animals, but not in people. So that's why they said, let's try mRNA. Do you think low CTs in an index case might correlate with increased secondary transmission? It could, right? But not necessarily because CT is measuring pieces of RNA, not infectious virus. And sometimes there's a discordance between the two. Um, so you have to be careful. It could be an association, but you have to prove it by looking at infectious virus. What virus is Amy working on? She's working on uh, enterovirus D68, which is a respiratory virus that can cause paralysis in young children. And um, she's she, doing a little bit on SARS-CoV-2, but most of her time is EVD68. All right, I'm going to stay for another two minutes, folks. And then I will see you next week. Uh, why can't mRNA vaccines be one dose rather than two? I think in the preclinical work they did years before January last year on other viruses, at least in animals, two, two doses were needed to get a good uh, immune response and good memory. And so that's how they trialed them in people. You, if you had the luxury of time, you could um, do trials in people, but we don't have the luxury of time. So they said, we're going to do two doses, and that's it. Now, if you want to try one dose now, you could. And um, I hear that some companies are thinking of trying one dose of their vaccine to see how it works, and you could get those data in a, in a couple of months. So uh, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to try it. But, uh, you know, again, in the U.S., the FDA EUA is based on two doses, and you really can't change that. You got COVID after the vaccine. My second dose is scheduled four days after my quarantine ends. Should I delay? You should. Um, I, I don't know if you're doing this through a physician or through work, but you should talk to them. I would delay it because you're going to have a good um, response to COVID, and that may interfere with the immunization. Yeah. 
Should people be taking vitamin D? For sure. Everyone should. Um, it's, it's not hurting you to take it at the right dose, and it, it's good for other reasons, and it might help you against uh, COVID. May, it might reduce the severity. So, yeah, I, I take vitamin D for sure. So the AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, approved on the basis of two full doses. Even though the half-dose, full-dose gave a better efficacy, they had more people in the full-dose, full-dose regimen, so they decided to do that. But they had some uh, data after one full dose, which now has allowed the UK to say, we're just given one dose of this. Uh, the Wunta Regeneron cocktail prevent the vaccine from working. Well, I don't think you should overlap them. If you get the Regeneron cocktail, you should wait a bit until the Regeneron antibodies are down because there's the off chance that the spike antibodies that they inject into you are going to interfere somehow with protein. I mean, most yeah. I mean, the protein is displayed on the surface of cells and presented to T cells, so that could be a problem. So you should wait, yeah. I have had measles and mumps decades ago. How would that cooperate with MMR? Um, yeah, I did too. When I was a kid, I had measles and mumps, and then I got MMR later. So it's just going to boost your memory. So it's not a it's not a bad thing, and it may prov it may somewhat protect against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So um, that's fine, I think. So I, I someone wants to know what vitamins we are taking. I take vitamin D. Actually, I take a multivitamin, which has everything in it, and it's. It covers it all. I don't take an excess of, uh, of any of them. <clears throat> all right, folks. I think that's it for tonight. I could go on for a long time, but I don't want to abuse your attention. So um, let me just say good night. And we'll be back in a week with Amy. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, if there's anything you want uh, answered, you could send an e email to twiv at microbe.tv and we could get prepared for it. So uh, thanks very much. And that note, I'll say good night and uh, stay safe, folks.